Hi everyone, my name is Abby Deal, and I'm going to be preaching part of your sermon today. So let's take out our Bibles and flip to John 14, 16 through 17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you forever. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to make a home in your heart. Let's look to John 20, 21 through 22. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He gave them the Holy Spirit. It came from God himself. The Holy Spirit empowers a believer. It gives them the power to get up and be witnesses for God. The indwelling of the Spirit is when the Spirit comes to live in you. David Gusick said in his commentary that Jesus gave his disciples the Holy Spirit, bringing new life and the ability to carry out their mission. It seems John noted a deliberate connection between this breathing on the disciples and when at creation God breathed life into the man. This is a work of recreation. Even as God breathed life into the first man, this is where the disciples were reborn. There's only one way to receive the Holy Spirit. It's by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. There are many experiences with the Holy Spirit. And one that is promised to believers is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We have a close friend whose story of receiving the Holy Spirit is really special. And this is her story. This happened to her while she was in college. She had just got water baptized and was really seeking the Lord. She wanted the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and she wanted to know it was truly from God and not made up. It was at the forefront of her mind all the time. She was going to work, driving on a crown side road, going to work, and for you guys who don't know what a crown side road, it basically slants and goes goes up in the middle. She worked as a waitress in a restaurant, and it was icy, but she was a Delawarean, so she went to work Anyway, while on her way there, she couldn't see that this guy was fishtailing in a green Corvette on the road in front of her. She was going on this narrow bridge, and right at the end of it, she saw him. She thought, God, if you have something for me, better save me now, otherwise I'm going to be with you really soon. This, and then she started speaking in tongues. And with her hands on 10 and 2, her car moved from the right lane to the left lane, and the guy fishtailed right around her. And again, God is her witness. Her hand stayed on 10 and 2, and she moved from the left lane back to the right lane. She, as she was driving down the road, she started thinking that she would have to start speaking English again, otherwise her customers or coworkers aren't going to understand her. I believe today God wants to indwell in all of you. I believe he wants to fill all of you. I believe he wants you to get to know him more. Let's pray. Dear God, I pray that everyone in this room will get filled with your Holy Spirit and will have the heart to seek after you and will get a lot out of the preaching today. In your name I pray, amen. It's good to get up to minister the word after somebody's already ministered the word, amen. Excited to see young people using their gifts and beginning to step into their calling. I want to say thank you to Pastor Dylan. I don't know, is he still in here? He may have slipped out. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, appreciate his kindness and hosting today. And when I turned and gave him a, a weird look, it, it had nothing, the weird look I gave you had nothing to do with you cheering for your wife. Totally other reasons I gave you weird look. So that's good. <laughs> it is good to be with the body of Christ today. Amen. My name is Bob, and I, uh, I have the privilege of serving at Evangel University in the seminary there. Uh, It's called the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary. I teach biblical studies and I teach uh, preaching. And I have the privilege of leading a uh, a segment of the institution called the Burnett Center for Biblical Preaching. And uh, we we want to take the resources of what God has invested and brought to the seminary in Springfield and begin to 
use those gifts uh, and those resources to bless preachers around the country and churches around the country. And so we, uh, we were just up this last, uh, on Friday, we were, uh, were working with the Southern Missouri District of the Assemblies of God, and uh, we're doing seminars and an ongoing training for preachers. Uh, Pastor Paul was in our session because he was going to be leaving to go on vacation. He came to our session in Springfield on Monday, uh, but we were up here in House Springs on Friday working with a group of pastors and just have had a great, great time uh, in this area. My, uh, the assistant director of the center has been traveling with me. We're going to be going on to some meetings in Illinois and this afternoon, and we are just blessed. I'm blessed to be able to take these moments and be with Lifestream Church. Went to college with your pastor and his wife. Uh, now, I have to clarify that, though. Pa- pastor Paul is much, much older than I am. Uh, I was only a, a, a lowly freshman when he was a, se- a mighty, a mighty senior at Central Bible College many years ago. And uh, But uh, thankful for uh, being able to share life and ministry together. Uh, and those relationships that emerged 30 years ago are still bearing fruit in in my life, in the life of my family. And so it is a joy. Who would have known? Who could have imagined? Uh, when uh, I, remember, I remember Pastor Paul's sermon every week. We had chapel five days a week at Central Bible College when we were there. We were required to be there. And I remember one day on Tuesdays every week, a member of the senior class would preach. And I was a freshman, and Pastor Paul was a senior, and I, uh, I actually remember his sermon. I remember him preaching in senior chapel at Central Bible College, and who could have imagined that nearly 30 years later, uh, nearly 30 years later, that the Lord would open an opportunity for me to stand in, uh, in his church uh, and at his uh, pulpit to preach God's word to, to the Lord's people. That's the wonderful and amazing plan of God that we can never imagine all that he has in store for us. Will we take just a a moment with me? Let's turn to the Lord as we turn our hearts to his word today. Heavenly Father, I pray that our hearts would be open. We need your spirit to help us, even in this moment, to understand and apply your word into our lives, to be willing and obedient, to step forward to what you're calling us for us, and in us. And so now we yield ourselves again to you. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. When I graduated from Bible college, my wife and I, we, we moved to Illinois. We both grew up in Indiana, northern Indiana, and we, we were brought on staff at a church. It was a, it was a good church in central Illinois, a very small town, very rural community. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the church was involved in farming. And uh, it was a town of about 1,200 people. The town was one mile square. And uh, it was um, an amazing journey. We interviewed with the pastor. It was a strong church. Uh, and, uh, and he was hiring a, a new youth pastor. He said to me in the interview, he said, we'd like to hire uh, another youth. This would be like for me, I would like this to be the last youth pastor I hire. I'm going to pastor. He'd been there 11 years. He said, I'm going to pastor six more years, and then I'm going to retire, and I'd like this to be the last youth pastor. And we said, Pastor, we'll do our very best. Uh, that seems like a reasonable goal, a reasonable expectation. So one year to the week after we arrived and became the youth pastor, uh, he youth pastors, he resigned and left the church and left us very much uncertain. We were expecting our first child, and And just still trying to figure so much out about life and ministry and marriage and family. And we found ourselves at a great transition moment. And so that was in May that he announced his resignation. And it was in November that that church did something that in retrospect, if I could go back and tell them, you may want to reconsider this decision. At the time, I thought thought it was absolutely the right choice. That crazy church elected a 23-year-old to be the lead pastor, and we began to step into the role of lead pastoral ministry. I will give you comfort, Pastor Dylan. Um, 
I forgot the offering many times, even as a lead pastor. So who knows? Maybe the door's still open for you. Um, and it was an amazing journey. God blessed. In fact, those first several years in pastoring there, in fact, all of our years of pastoring there in my near Illinois, they were filled with joy and wonder and God's sovereign purposes. And, and by outward metrics and so many of the measurements we tend to use to evaluate ministry effectiveness, they were some of the most fruitful days that, that we ever experienced in ministry, those early, early years. And yet, even in the midst of a season of incredible growth, both in the church, spiritually, numerically, financially, also in our own life, and our own family, I found myself within two to two and a half years, at 25 years old, deeply frustrated. Deeply frustrated. And this was in and of itself frustrating that I was frustrated because everything I had hoped for and everything I had prayed for since I first heard the call of God on my life as a 16-year-old was beginning to come into focus and it was beginning to happen. And yet in the midst of blessing and growth and just a great season surrounded by wonderful people, I kept finding myself frustrated. One of the things I did is I, I made appointments. I went to Springfield, Missouri, and I met with pastors and educators who had been a part of my life when I was in college, asking for their help and their insight. And so I made the decision in the midst of all of my frustration and all of my struggle, which was real, that the answer was I needed a hobby. I needed a hobby. Because I began to diagnose what my problem was and why I was so frustrated in ministry is because I was learning in those first two years that the task was never going to be done. I liked things. Like when I was in high school, math and sciences were my favorite classes because I loved the fact that you could take a problem work through the system, and when it was done, there was a right answer to get to, and then you were done with that problem. It was satisfying, all wrapped up, nice and neat and clean. And ministry was anything but nice or neat and never clean. The job was never done. We grew, but there was... A larger community that needed to be reached. People were growing in the Lord. They still had a ways to go. For every marriage that came through a difficult season into a moment of health and joy and love, there was another marriage that was entering a season of crisis and struggle and conflict. For every new believer that gave their life to Jesus at the altar, there was a believer struggling with addiction and sin and brokenness in their life. And even if we had reached maturity with every person in that church, even if everybody was healthy and strong and nobody was sick, nobody was in the hospital, nobody was struggling, even if we'd done all that, even in that little tiny town of 1,200 people, our church at this point was running about 220 people, which meant just in our single little town, which there were little towns every five miles in that area, completely surrounded by cornfields, and every five miles there'd be a little town. Even if we reached and were running 200 in that little town, that meant just in my near alone, there were another 1,000 people that needed to know Jesus. And this deep realization was settling into my heart that no matter how hard I worked, no matter how hours I put in, no matter what was happening around us, it was never going to get done. And so I decided I needed a hobby. I went to an auction, and I bought a table saw. 
and I decided I was going to take up woodworking. I mean, I could have decided I was going to work through my issues and my baggage and my emotional brokenness and spend some time with Jesus and get it right, but I decided let's do woodworking instead. That other part seems like a lot of work, and I might have to face some things. Let's build a blanket chest. And I built a blanket chest, a shaker-style blanket chest. Norm Abrams, the new Yankee workshop. I bought his book. I watched his video. I bought a table saw and a couple other tools, and I put together a blanket chest. It still sits in one of our bedrooms. And it was so satisfying to take a pile of wood, cut it to size, join the edges, glue up the top, mortise and tendon joints in the side, put it together, sand it, stain it, put some polyurethane on it, and fill it with blankets. Because there was a starting point and there was an ending point. And nothing else in my life was affording me that satisfaction. And so then I built an end table and some bunk beds, and I just kept pouring myself in my free time into my woodworking hobby. One day I was reading in Scripture in the Old Testament in the book of Numbers, chapter 11, and I encountered a story, and I realized I'm not the only person who's ever had that moment that realized it doesn't matter how hard I work, how much I do, how successful everything around me is, I can't do enough. I can't get there. I, I think if we could have gathered Moses and sat down with Moses and had an honest conversation with him, I think he would have been honest enough with us to say, been there, done that. And if I had been there to counsel him, I'd have said, Moses, you need to go to the, the harbor freight of the Sinai Peninsula or maybe the Lowe's, if there's one of those, on the desert sands of the wilderness and go buy a table saw and build a blanket chest. But Moses is so spiritual, he has a conversation with the Lord. That's what's happening in Numbers chapter 11. Moses is having a painfully honest conversation with the Lord. I just, I'm going to touch on a few parts in bringing us to our text today. So people are mad. People are angry. They, they've been delivered from slavery. They've been brought through the Red Sea. They've heard the voice of God. They've received the law of God. God is raining down grain to make bread from heaven for them, and they're mad. They're like, eh, we're kind of tired of bread. Go get some meat. In fact, they went even further. They went so far as to say, God, we don't even know why we're out here. We'd rather go back to Egypt. There was fish, glorious abundant, wonderful fish, and it was free. And there was garlic and cucumbers and onions. It was so delightful. And why in the world are we out here? And all we get is this nasty manna. We want to go back. They were rejecting God's provision for them. And so this is Moses in chapter 11, verse 10. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans. Everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord blazed hotly. That's a bad day, right? You don't really want that statement over your, nobody's writing that on a thing and putting it over their doorpost in there. And the anger of the Lord blazed greatly. And Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child? Go to the land that you swore to give to your fathers, give to their fathers. Where am I to get meat to give all this people? For they weep. They weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, here's a prayer I've not prayed. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find, if I find favor in your sight, that I might not see my own wretchedness. Here's, here's Moses' prayer. God, if you care about me at all, if you love me at all, just kill me. Render me a pile of ashes with a great, glorious, flaming, blazing lightning bolt and just end it for me. 
because I don't want to do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. These people are driving me crazy. And Moses, I love it. The scriptures tell us Moses is angry. God is angry. And the people are angry. Everybody, everybody in this story is frustrated and unhappy. In a moment of the greatest miracle in the history of Israel, the deliverance of the Exodus, after all that God had done, now you've got this 600,000 people, you've got Moses, and you've got God, and every one of them is like, well, this was a bad mistake. Everybody's angry. Everybody's disappointed. Everybody's frustrated. And Moses says, I can't do it anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. I'd rather be dead than do this anymore. This is a bad day in the plan of God to bring redemption and salvation to the world. It's a critical moment in biblical history. See, God had been working all along, and he had been revealing himself all along. And all of the ways he had led them had brought them to this moment, and nobody's happy. Think think about how God had done it. When he brought them out of Egypt, the Scriptures tell us that the presence of the Lord went with them, and it led them by day in a pillar of cloud, and at night by a pillar of fire. And when they got to Mount Sinai, it was not that they were going to, the, the, the initial plan or what was going on there was not that they would get these tablets of stone. The scriptures tell us that the Lord himself wanted to speak to the people. Because this was the promise. I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will dwell among you. That was the plan. That's how God wanted to work. And he leads them out by his own direct presence fire in the cloud, and they get to Mount Sinai. And the Lord tells us, the scriptures reveal to us, that the Lord himself spoke so all the people could hear his voice. How many times have you prayed, Lord, I just need, I need your direction. I need your insight. I need your wisdom. Tell me what you want. Just speak to me. Well, Israel got it. The thing that people have always wanted. And do you know what their response was? When God spoke, he thundered his voice from heaven and they heard it. Their response was, they said to Moses, you go back and tell him, we don't want to hear that again. You talk to God and tell us what he said. We don't want that anymore. That was terrifying. See, God tried to personally lead them and they rejected it. And then you had Moses. God established the mouthpiece through whom he would speak. The scriptures tell us that Moses would talk to God as a man would talk to a friend face to face. And then Moses would meet with God and he'd come and tell the people. And you think, ah, well, there's a solution. God's kind of scary to talk to, so Moses will hear from God. He seems to be cool with that. And now Moses will come and tell us what God had said. And you know what? They rejected that. Didn't work. And then Moses is trying to juggle all of this. Everybody who has a conflict, everybody who has a problem, they go to Moses. And it's wearing them out. This is before they get to Sinai. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, comes along and says, you can't keep doing this. What you should do is establish elders and heads over segments of the community. Layers of leadership. Develop a bureaucracy that will manage the simple problems, and you only deal with the big problems, and set up a system. So now they raised up leadership. They equip people. They put together a plan, and they laid out this method to help lead the nation because Moses was killing himself trying to do it. And you know what? Didn't work. Didn't work. Didn't keep them pure. Didn't keep them on the track. Didn't keep them walking honestly before the Lord. So Moses is summoned to the mountain. He goes up in the mountain and the cloud and the fire descend on the mountain. And God thunders in that mountain, speaks to Moses, gives him the law of God, writes out the ten big laws. 
The Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, inscribes it on stone. And you think, okay, now, you didn't want God speaking to you, and you, didn't, you weren't satisfied with Moses leading you, and the elders haven't fully accomplished what we needed. This will do it. God will speak, dictate, and write out exactly what he wants from his people so that it will all work. And here, I'm going to write it down. You guys can see it, and you'll know exactly what to do. This is how I'll lead you. Moses comes down from the mountain. How long did it take them to mess that plan up? 30 seconds. Moses is coming down the mountain. He goes, hey, that sounds weird. Joshua's with him. He's like, yeah, that does sound weird. Sounds like war. He's like, Moses, no, I don't think that's war. Nope, it was an idolatrous, pagan, revelry, out of control mess. It literally took them a matter of minutes to ruin the plan of a clear, expressed law of God written down so they would know it. it didn't work. And then we come here to chapter 11, and it's not working. Everybody's unhappy. And so now the Lord comes up with a new plan. Then the Lord, in verse 16, Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me 70 men of Israel, elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there. And I will take some of the spirit that is on you and I will put it on them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you may not bear it yourself alone. And say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow and you shall eat meat for you have wept in the hearing of the Lord saying, who will give us meat to eat? So now God has a plan. He says, call together the elders. Now this is separate than the elder plan put together by Jethro and Moses. This is after Mount Sinai. It's after the building of the tabernacle. It's after all of that. It's after the law where the other one was before. And think of the differences. This was a plan devised by Jethro. This is a plan instituted by God. This is a plan that was trying to systematize and manage the problems of the nation. This is God saying, by my spirit, I will equip them and they will do it. Think, All right, now we're getting somewhere. Didn't work with God leading them. Didn't work with Moses leading them. Didn't work with a plan built out of the, set, the elders of the nation and a system. It didn't work with the expression of the law to keep them on track, moving forward, living into their divine destiny as the people through whom the nations would be blessed. And now, God says, you bring me elders. I'm going to pour out my spirit on them. I'm going to take a part of the spirit that's on you. I'm going to place it on them. I'm going to empower them. I'm going to set them to do the work, and they will share the burden with you. Finally, finally, we got it all together. Finally, we've, we've got the pieces in place. It's the Spirit of God on these elders who will lead. It's, it's kind of like as a father. Saved up, worked hard, set aside money for a long time. Made a trip. Took my kids, my three boys, to Orlando, Florida. I said, you can either go to college or we can go to Disney World. And we decided to go to Disney World. And you think, this is the happiest place on earth. They're going to have an experience of a lifetime. We're going to go to Space Mountain and we're going to see the animal kingdom, and we're going to ride Dumbo. And we wandered through a former swamp at, I think it was about 183 degrees with 112 degree humidity, and I listened to three boys grumble, complain, and whine the whole way through. We stood in line to get a picture. I have this picture. I have a picture of our middle child with Mickey and Minnie. We stood in line to get the picture with Mickey and Minnie. And you have never seen a more miserable child in the history of humanity. And you're like, I, we have come halfway across the country. I have spent my entire inheritance. We have done, I've spent your inheritance. I've, I've given you everything I can. And nobody's happy. It had to be the way God felt. But 
the 70 elders anointed by the Spirit. And God does it. He pours out his Spirit, and, and it's this amazing moment. They gather together, and the Spirit, the Lord takes of the Spirit on Moses, and he distributes it. Now, there were supposed to be seven. There were only 68. The Scripture is very clear to us. There were two guys that didn't, they were signed up, supposed to be there. They had registered for the conference, and they decided to stay back home. We don't know why. Maybe there was a ball. The Chiefs were playing. I don't know. The Cardinals. Maybe it was summer. Cardinals were playing. Maybe, maybe they had a busy day. Maybe they needed to rake the, 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 the sand in front of their hut. I don't know. But they didn't go. Eldad and Medad. We actually know what their names mean. Eldad, we don't know much else about him. Eldad means lover of God. Medad, he's more my style. His name means lover of fat. Well, I just have a feeling Medad, Medad's that guy that, you know, because when you hit about 35 years old as a man in the United States, you have to make a choice. You're either going to become obsessed with World War II history or you're going to start smoking meat. One of the two, you have a choice. That's where you're at, right? And me dad's the guy, it's like, let's make a brisket because I love me some fat. For whatever their reason, they didn't go out there. Spirit of God is poured out. Me dad and Eldad start prophesying. The scriptures are, here's what happens. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 of the men of the elders of the people, and he placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him, and he put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord, Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. So something was happening. When they... When the Spirit came upon them, and it says they prophesied. If you read it in context, when you look back in this period of Israel's history, whenever you talk about prophecy, now in, in, in a typical church like this, if you talk about prophecy, we would think, okay, it would be a thus saith the Lord, and somebody would tell us an encouraging word or an insight from the Lord. Or, or maybe we might think of an Old Testament or a New Testament prophet that's, that's predicting something God's going to do. But back in this time period, when you talked about prophecy, and you can prove this from examples throughout the Scripture, it was usually a really dramatic and what we might call in this an ecstatic experience where the Spirit of God comes upon a person and, they, and the Spirit kind of takes over. And, and sometimes there's one where a person just lays out and is there motionless for a long period of time in the Old Testament, and they called that prophesying. There's others where they spoke. There's others where they sang. There's others where they danced. When the Spirit of the Lord would come, and it was this overpowering, overwhelming, rushing on of the Spirit, which was attended by an outward sign or experience or expression, often verbal at some level. That's what happened, and it was so remarkable and so overwhelming that even Eldad and Medad, when they weren't with the group, they didn't see what had happened with the group, but back in the camp, they had the same exact experience when the Spirit of God, they were marked. There was a sign. There was an evidence that came upon them. And the Spirit of God filled their life and empowered them to serve, and they prophesied in the Scripture, say, but they didn't continue to do it. But in that moment, they were marked with the power of the Spirit expressed through this ecstatic spiritual experience. And this kid comes running up and says, there's a problem. Two guys back in the camp prophesying. And Joshua, he's, he's, he's like, stop it. we got to stop them. we got to get a hold of them and make that quit. And Moses, Moses says something pretty remarkable. He says, are you jealous for me? This is what we waited for, Joshua. We can't do this on our own. We need all of the people. We need 
We need Eldad and Medad to have the Spirit of God on them too, just like we need the other 68. It's funny. There were 68 that did the right thing, were where they were supposed to be at the right time. We don't know any of their names. These two yahoos missed the appointment with the Lord, and we get to know their names. That's the way it works, right? So finally, it's fixed. Didn't work with just the Lord leading them. Didn't work with just Moses leading them. Didn't work with the plan to create a bureaucracy. It didn't work when they had it written down in an encoded expression of God's expectation. But now, finally, God said, get the elders. I'll put my spirit on them. And now a spirit-empowered group of leaders will now together lead the nation. And finally, they will live into their purpose. They will walk in the right ways. And they will be used by God to bring righteousness. Nope. Moses' brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam, rebel against him after, after this moment. A guy named Korah leads an incredible, devastating, and destructive rebellion after this moment. Moses sends 12 spies into the promised land after this moment, and they're getting ready to go possess the promise of God. The spies come back, 10 of them go, can't do it. Not able to get there. There's giants over there. They've got technology and abilities beyond us. We can't do it. God says, all right, I'm done. This whole generation, you're going to die in the wilderness because you've not believed me. Every step of the way, it'll be your children that go in. And now they're like, well, we're sorry, God. No, we believe you now. Let's go. So then they disobey God when he said, you're not going. Now they decided they will go. They go up, and they're routed, and they're conquered in battle, and they flee out. I mean... I thought this incredible core of spiritual, charismatic, empowered leaders, surely this will fix it. And the nation will live into the purposes and the plans of God. And yet what we find, same failures, same disappointments, same letdowns. Same suffering, same judgment that have tended every other failure. Is there no hope? Are we left with Moses to be frustrated, angry, disillusioned, disappointed, overwhelmed? Is that just our lot as God's people? Is that that all that's left to us? We do our best. We work real hard. In the end, we're all just going to be frustrated. Because that seems to be where this story goes. Except for a little moment tucked in to the conversation. And Moses says this to Joshua. I would that all of God's people would prophesy. And that the Lord would put his spirit on all of his people. All of a sudden in this moment we recognize it was never meant to be about one individual or one group of individuals or just some really, really effective and charismatic leaders. No, that was never God's plan for his people. He had a bigger plan. And what Moses gives voice to here in Numbers chapter 11 is a prayer that would be fulfilled on the day of Pentecost many, many years later. More than a millennia later, there was an answer to this prayer. I would that all of God's people would prophesy and that he would put his spirit on them all. I want you to understand today that the promise of the spirit of God to empower you and to empower the church to live out the mission of God, to walk into the purposes of God was never meant to just be on a pastor or a youth pastor or deacons and elders alone. It wasn't just for the person on TV or the highly gifted mega church pastor. The spirit of God was destined for you and for me for everyone in this place, I would to God that he would have put his spirit on all of God's people. That's what he's promised to you. It was never about a small group or an individual. It was always about the spirit of God was for all of God's people. See, from Moses' prayer, I would that all of God's people would prophesy. We fast forward to 
Jeremiah's words in one of the low moments in the entire nation of Israel's existence when they were facing captivity and bondage again, carried off into bondage in Babylon. It was there, he said, Jeremiah said, you may have broken the covenant, but God is going to do a new covenant. And instead of it being an old covenant written on tablets of stone, it will be written on your heart that the Spirit of God will be within you and He will work from the inside out rather than the outside in. And then Joel comes along a little bit later and he says this, I will pour out my Spirit upon all all flesh, on your sons and your daughters, on the old and on the young, on the slaves and on the free. I'm going to pour out my spirit. It is not bound. It is not limited. It is not classified by what the world may think and who the world may think is worthy. He says, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh, and I am going to let the spirit of God remain on you, and I will work from the inside out of you. I will do the miraculous, the supernatural, the power. And now on the day of Pentecost, after Jesus' death, burial, resurrection and ascension into heaven on the day of Pentecost it says they were all together in one place and suddenly there came a sound like a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared over them fire as if cloven tongues of fire and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want you to understand what Moses predicted what Jeremiah pointed to what the gospel, what the prophet Joel led us to understand was fulfilled on Pentecost and it is for you you today. The success of this church, the effectiveness of the ministry of Livestream is not built on how effective your program is, how beautiful your building might be, how gifted and charismatic your pastoral staff may be, how blessed, wise, and, in, and hardworking your elder team might be. The success of this church is that the Spirit of God has been poured out upon all flesh, and the Spirit of God wants to work through you. It wants to speak through you. It wants to make you a powerful witness for the Lord. This was God's plan all along. The failure of Israel, the failure of the people in the wilderness was not our failure. You have the Spirit of God. You have the promise of the Spirit fulfilled among you. And what would happen if we stopped thinking that, that effectiveness in ministry and service is relegated to the just gifted few? But it's for everyone. that a 10-year-old touched by the power of the Spirit could be a witness for Jesus, could pray for the sick and see them recover, open the door to faith with the expression of the gospel, just like a 85-year-old grandma can walk in the power of the Spirit and give testimony to the redeeming, sanctifying, healing power of Jesus Christ. It could be the poor. You may have nothing, but if you have the Spirit of God, He can work through you in ways that will change Washington and Union and all of the surrounding cities and towns around us. All of you. That's the promise Moses pointed to. A tired, frustrated, burned out leader of the nation said, I want everybody to experience the power of God's Spirit leading their life. And on a Sunday called Pentecost, nearly 2,000 years ago, that promise was fulfilled. And it's for you today. You can change your world as you let the power of the Spirit of God work through you. I would that all of God's people prophesied and that he put his spirit on all of them. You were a part of Moses' prayer. You were a part, are a part of God's plan. 
But maybe you're here and you're, you're more like me, dad, and Eldad. Maybe you're just hanging out in the camp. Maybe you're busy. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you've got doubts. Maybe you've been hurt. Right? We get it. It was a real thing. Church hurt can be a real thing. Maybe you've got burned in the past. Somebody took advantage of you. Maybe somebody manipulated you. Maybe somebody treated you poorly. And you have begun to close in your heart and your spirit Because somebody let you down, you closed your heart to letting God work in you. I will tell you, the fact that somebody let you down does not equate to that God let you down. And your hurt, your unforgiveness, your wound, I don't know why me, dad, and Eldad didn't come out to the meeting when they were supposed to. But I know there are people today that hold back from living into God's purpose for their life. And again, when we say God's purpose for your life, sometimes we've given the impression, well, if you're going to live into God's purpose, you've got to go be a preacher. No, most of you are not called to be a preacher. You're called to be a farmer, a school teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a factory worker. My dad dropped out of high school when he was 16 years old got drafted into the army, came home, became a machinist, operated a CNC lathe to the day that he died. And it'd be really easy to just say, well, you know, I didn't get to, I, I'm, the other people serve the Lord. But my dad served in ministries to boys, to men. He loved, he cared, he sacrificed, he gave. Because somewhere along the way, he understood that the power of the Spirit overcame his past and his failings and still wanted to use him. And you need to hear today that it's not about your background or your degrees, your reputation, the amount of money you have, or your past successes. It's always been about the Spirit of God. So get out of the camp, get out of the tent, And go where you're supposed to be and open your heart and let the Spirit of God fill you. And may the fulfillment of Acts 1-8 be lived out in your life. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Washington, Pacific, Union, St. Louis, Missouri, the Midwest, even to the uttermost parts of the earth as the Spirit of God fills your life. Bow your heads with me this morning. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back to the instruments. Are you here today? And you're tired and you're frustrated. You're worn out. You're beat up. Or maybe you're just kind of uncertain and confused and lost. Maybe you have doubts. Whatever it is that's going on in you, what what you need is a fresh touch of the Spirit of God on your life. And I'm not going to manipulate that or say it has to look this way or that or force it into, I'm just here to tell you, if you need a fresh touch from the Lord, a fresh anointing of His Spirit, a fresh setting apart, a fresh empowerment, because like the Israelites, you're frustrated, or like Moses, you're burned out. I only have one answer to you. It's this one. I would that all of God's people would prophesy and that he would put his spirit on them all. So put aside your fear, your doubts, your hurts, your disappointments, your frustrations. Set it aside today and say, Lord, I want more of your spirit in my life. May your spirit be put upon me again. Or maybe for the first time you're praying that prayer. Lord, fill me with your spirit today. Can we stand all over this room? Just.
stand with me? As you stand still, every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask you a question. I'm not going to make you come forward unless you feel led to come forward. But I'm just going to ask you with every head bowed, a moment of honesty. Are you here today and maybe you're weary? You're frustrated. You're angry. You're hurt. You're disappointed. Whatever it may be, I don't know. I don't need to know, except for I, I, I want you to know you're not alone. But you'd say, Bob, I, I know I need a fresh touch of the Spirit. I'm just going to pray for you, and we're going to worship and invite the Spirit of the Lord. Is there anybody here to say, that's me? I know I need a fresh touch of the Spirit. Thank you. Yep, 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 yep. Is there anybody else? Yeah. Put aside your fear and your doubts. We can look at this in Scripture. With lots of answers. Lots of things. I'm not saying shut your brain off. The good thing is the Lord invites you to come to you with your brain fully engaged. Is there anybody else say, I, I need a fresh touch of the Spirit of God on my life? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're just going to invite him to do it. He just showed up at the tent of meeting. I believe he's going to just show up in Washington, Missouri today as we worship and respond to him. Let's worship the Lord.